Now, when I was thinking what I could um, possibly say about liberalism and fascism, I realized that I don't really have much to say. But then I continued thinking and I came to this idea of logic of exclusion as something that, you know, that both these tendencies, liberal and fascist, have in common. Now, soon, of course, I realized that this is a very general abstraction, perhaps even banal or trivial. So, to get something meaningful out of it, I would have to um, uh, put some concrete uh, content into it, and this is what uh, came out. So, at first, <coughs> three approaches uh, seemed reasonable to me. First was fairly obvious, and that is to take liberalism and fascism and show in what way liberal and fascist authors and practices were, in fact, exclusionary. Uh, the second approach would be to show that, uh, what is exclusion, in fact, exclusion of. What is it that is being excluded and in what way? And the third way or the third approach would be to show on what basis is something being excluded, that is, what is the foundation on which a theory bases some sort of exclusion. Now, of course, these are not only three approaches through which one could elaborate some sort of theory of exclusion in regards to fascism and liberalism, but much more necessary steps one must take to point at some shared characteristics of liberalism and fascism. So if I firstly address perhaps the easiest part of this undertaking, what is the exclusion exclusion of? I think we could all agree, in fact being uh, all here are mostly, all here mostly did in social sciences and communities that the subject being excluded was mostly and primarily a human being. Now whether being some slave on the plantation of Thomas Jefferson in Virginia or an inmate of a prison workhouse in England, placed outside of law and human community or a Jew in a Nazi concentration camp. It has always been a human being that was being excluded from a political community. So I think it's fair to assume at this point that the exclusion we ought to talk about is the exclusion of men and women, and this exclusion being of various uh, sorts, of course. Now, to be clear, this, of course, doesn't tell us much yet, so what I'll try to do now is show what were, in fact, the basis for exclusion. Now, there are three foundations of exclusion I wanted to talk about. Uh, as it will become clear, all three are intertwined. Now, first would be the exclusion based on property, second, the exclusion of persons, and thirdly, a spatial exclusion. Now, as far as persons and property are concerned, they have often been interchangeable. A uh, person has often been treated as property, and even more property was often considered more valuable than a person. Um, so what can we say about property as a basis of exclusion in liberal and fascist thought? Property, as Ishalanda states, was, and I quote, from the beginning the liberal sine qua non, and politics, as Landa continues, whether tyrannical, monarchical, aristocratic, or democratic, was regarded as legitimate to the extent that it respects and protects the economic core. For John Locke, for example, property and capitalist production do not form a part of the political sphere, but underlie it. Similarly, in Benjamin Constant, one of the first to be called liberal, we find two notions of freedom, one legitimate economic freedom and another illegitimate political freedom that violates the right of property. Now, as Landa notes, similar arguments, as in Constant, we can later find in a fascist author, Alfredo Rocco. Constant saw England as the practical model of freedom. England, which in the end of 17th, 18th, and the beginning of the 19th century, saw an increase in death penalties, where the charged were almost always accused of crimes against property. Now, crime against property was considered more severe than murder, as Domenico Lasurda points out at one point, stealing a handkerchief could get you hanged, and it mattered little if the perpetrator was a child or not. Now, slavery is, of course, one of the great topics where equating man and property becomes most visible. Uh, what is often forgotten is the fact that the New Age slavery comes to life at exactly the same time as classical liberalism and its golden age. Uh, the first country that went liberal, the Netherlands, simultaneously became the biggest proponent of slavery and anti-abolitionism. In the United States, ever since its emergence, slavery and political power were indirectly connected. As the Surda points out, after land, slaves were the biggest property in the United States. A relation between a master and slave was a private relation where a master could, without intervention, from the state dispose of his property as he chose to. Now the problem that emerged soon enough was a conflict, uh, something that Landa calls a liberal split between economic and political liberalism, where economic liberalism pursued market logic and free trade, and political liberalism strove towards a greater inclusion of the masses in political life and participation. Um, and although I find this conflict important, I will address it uh, just a bit later. For now, let's just say that freedom inside the liberal tradition was obviously limited to some and non-existent for others. Uh, it's important to know that not only this holds true for the real existing situation, but also for the theoretical background that legitimized the liberal project. 
I also mentioned the third way of exclusion, a spatial one. Now, I mentioned this because it is heavily present not only in liberal but also in fascist tradition. So in this respect, it's worth mentioning that even in those cases where liberals criticize slavery, they did not question the division of the world on the civilized West and the barbarism of everyone else. So, for example, followers of Fourier and Saint-Simon imagined their utopian communities in Algeria on the land that would be taken from the Arabs. Uh, regarding England, slavery was removed in a strict sense to geographically remote areas, far from civilization where the spirit of freedom was not so strong. Um, a meaningful distinction is made by Domenico Lusurdo between the sacred space and the profane space, profane space, a distinction between the sacred space of Europe where the spirit of freedom is alive and on the other hand the barbaric space of the colonized world. Uh, this served as an argument of exclusion in a variety of forms in uh, most of the liberal thinkers. So okay, by now I hope it's pretty much clear that liberal tradition is not as liberal as it seems. If nothing else, we could state that any defense of classical liberalism would have great trouble defending certain aspects of it, mainly, as I said, the logic of exclusion of certain subjects from the political community. Um, the question now, of course, remains what is the connection between liberalism and fascism? Um, I have mentioned the so-called liberal split. It is, as Landa writes, a process whereby, and I quote, Economic liberalism and political liberalism began drifting apart to the point of finding themselves on opposite sides of socio-economic divide. Now what does this mean? It means, to put it simply, that the rules of economic liberalism were beginning to be hindered by the rules of political liberalism. That is, the pressures of mass movements and their entry into the political arena and parliamentary struggle. That is, democratic tendencies. Uh, in Landa, we find this divide being crucial for the eruption of fascism. In his argument, fascism was a reply to a long-term crisis of liberalism and a response to revolutionary and democratic socialism. I will try to say a few words regarding this split in the end. <coughs> For now, I'll just try to sketch how fascist theory and ideology entered the arena exactly through this rupture that seemingly formed itself inside the liberal camp. Um, now, for now, I'd just like to toss out a few examples to show just how fascism indeed intervened on the side of economic liberalism. And of course, uh, here also I'll be leaning on Ishalanda's work. Our first example is the program <coughs> of the Partito Nazionale Fascista, the Italian Fascist Party, from August 1922, in which economic liberalism was directly inscribed and approved by liberal economists. Uh, as Landa writes, at the time, most economic liberals in Italy considered the fascist government as the best possible solution. Landa's argument, as it goes, is that liberalism and fascism are not two antagonistic bodies of thought, but that fascism simply intervened on the side of economic liberalism when it came to defending capitalism and on the side of anti-liberalism when in question were political aspects of liberalism. Another good example is a man you've all heard of, that's Wilfredo Pareto, an economic liberal par excellence, who rejected democracy and stated that only elites can rule. Uh, Pareto insisted on scientific impossibility of democracy and thus strongly influenced uh, Robert Michels and his theories. Uh, what Landa points out, and I think it's crucial, is the fact that Pareto defended the dictatorship of the elites on the premises of economic liberalism. As Landa says, Pareto remains a liberal even after he denounces democracy entirely. Now, a similar role as Pareto played in Italy is attributed to Stringer in Germany, who called for market economy and national greatness. There are more examples, of course, but just one more should suffice, and that is uh, Ludwig von Mises, another great liberal uh, who became an economic advisor in an Austro-Fascist government of Dolfus, a government that abolished democracy. Now the list goes on and on, you can all read about this in Landa's book, but I, I think the point was made. Um, just another thing worth mentioning at this point is the post-Second World War discourse on fascism and Nazism that tried to explain them as revolts against industry and capitalism that is against economic liberalism. I think a fair amount of analysis has been made on economic origins of Nazism and don't need to stress about the capitalist nature of the system. Uh, I would, however, again add an additional point mentioned by Landa, and that is the very name of National Socialist Party. Now, the name itself was simply a part of propaganda, and because in uh, times of crisis it simply wasn't popular and irrational to defend capitalism. So, as Landa shows, and I tried to shortly summarize, fascism as an intellectual current does not stand on its own feet. We could go in further saying that fascism was an integral part of a body of thought we came to call liberalism. It reinforces one side of liberalism while suppresses another. Now, if classical liberalism carried in itself a logic of exclusion, a certain limit that was not to be crossed no matter what, 
this idea of a liberal split suggests that this logic in first instance pertains to economic liberalism and thus also to fascism, and also that the political side of liberalism is in some way exclusion-free. Now this would mean that there exists a great divide between two forms of liberalism, and what I want to do was to uh, say a few words about this divide. Now, an impression is perhaps formed that political liberalism can stand on its own as a political form of mass democratic participation. An impression is furthermore made that a democratic political form can pose not only a threat, as the fascists saw it, but also a counterweight to economic liberalism and market economy. And this again opens the question of what in fact means to be a liberal. Now, my suggestion here would be the following. <clears throat> Instead of seeing this liberal split as a creation of a barrier between two forms of liberal thought, I would suggest to contemplate this very body of thought exactly from the position of this divide or split. And by this I mean that the split or divide assumes a constitutive function for the entire liberal project. Now, the fascinating thing about fascism is that it points to this constitutive character of this divide. And, but what really should be done here is to show what this divide in reality is. So I would assume that in a class society a project of political liberalism is doomed to fail as long as there exists such a thing as the market. If economic liberalism presupposes formal equality of workers on the market, political liberalism in these respects holds its hand for as long as it can, or better yet, for as long as conditions for this are present. Now in fascism, political power is freed of all restraints, but this does not mean that this omnipotence of political power is inappropriate for its economic foundation. On the contrary, it is the only true expression of this economic foundation. If fascism is the continuation of capitalist production independently of the market, that is, exa that is exactly the truth of the market itself. Now, as Mladen Dular wrote, the psychotic discourse of fascism bypasses class relations as they reveal themselves in the symptoms of society and stands in the place of these symptoms, of this gap itself. So in this respect, we could say that fascism is the symptom of a sickness called liberalism. And one of the main themes of fascist propaganda, by the way, was exactly drawing borders, making distinctions, and so on. Um, now, the irony is that what I tried to sketch, basing my short reflection on the banal fact that liberal and fascist traditions are based on certain logic of exclusion, uh, is that somewhat backfired as I returned to this exclusion and pose it as a founding stone of liberal thought. Now, Let's pretend it has been shown that history of liberalism never really was fully inclusive, leaving aside what fully inclusive really means in this context. Uh, considering the democratic form of government, can we not say that the quality one achieves through it is just another side of this abstract equality one assumes as a laborer on the market? Or furthermore, doesn't this rupture in the liberal camp imply that there is something inherently wrong with this division of society and political sphere on the one hand and the sphere of civil society on the other? Now, naturally, these are all questions and topics often addressed by Marxists and Marx, and it is no coincidence that I come to this conclusion. Now, to quote Marx on this point, as he wrote in the Critique of Marx's Philosophy of Right, he says that each has the possibility of gaining the privilege of another's spur proves only that his own spur is not the actuality of this privilege. And he goes on saying that the state and civil society are separated, which means a man must also be split himself. Now, now, Marx's critique of capitalism go, goes beyond, I think, the liberal split exactly because it understands this split as a constitutive part of a capitalist society. Uh, private property, of which I spoke before, as a person and, and as a subject is labor. Labor is its essence and capital is its form. Um, the evolution in the forms of exclusion inherent in liberalism is simply the evolution and the creation of capitalist social relations. As Marx continues, the difference is not in the content but in the mode of presentation. And I think that is why fascism does not need a special corpus of literature on which fascist doctrines would be based, because it stands on the very position of this representation that is in fact divided, that is in fact a split. A split that is not based on the difference between political representation and market relations, but on the very rules of capitalism, rules where exploitation is easily masked as equality, where freedom becomes its opposite in concreto without any legitimate reason, and so on and so on, you know, the story. So, I think if we must find a primary side of exclusion, in my opinion, it has to be the market. Slaves were sold on the market as commodities and white servants have for a long time suffered a similar fate. Social rights and workers' coalitions were destroyed and all this in the name of the market. So I, I have in this uh, short sketch intentionally left out the benefits that liberalism has brought to our society. And in this respect, I find again Marx's words quite accurate when he said that the 
bourgeoisie is cursing a socialist, what it had before celebrated as liberal, liberal, and furthermore, when he says, as the general electoral right calls against the dominion of the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie retains the general electoral right. That being said, let me conclude this by saying that I do not find the entire liberal tradition completely useless. If anything, there was a time when liberal was a synonym for progressive, and I just think that that time has passed and the time has come for political liberalism to not only see in its twin brother for what it really is, but also to go beyond the limits of political liberalism itself, beyond something that has become quite a discipline, discipline and an end in itself on the political science departments. Now, if you were to excuse me, I had problem finishing as much as I had problem starting, so I would finish with another quote, in which, in my opinion, the core of what I attempted to say lies, and of course, again, the quote is by Marx, as he wrote. But the completion of the idealism of the state at the same time, the completion of the materialism of civil society. Throwing off the politically augment, at the same time, throwing off the bonds which restrain the egoistic spirit of civil society. Political emancipation was, at the same time, the emancipation of civil society from politics, from having even, even the semblance of a universal country. That's about it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anjef, for your uh, contribution. We will continue with uh, Martin Hergold, and the title of his uh, contribution is uh, Twin Liberal Confusions, uh, Fascism, or Totalitarianism, and Hegel. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I will structure the, the point that I wish to present here uh, in three parts. Uh, first, I will outline um, the target of, of, of my intervention, um, which is, I think, um, still worthy of attack, in spite of not being particularly original target. That is a certain contemporary liberal cons liberal consensus and its understanding of fascism that is uh, this is a bit structured by something uh, we'll call totalitarian paradigm. Uh, then, in the second part, I will proceed to some uh, very limited discussion of Hegel, more precisely of his commentary, commentary of French Revolution, I will dare attempt to show how his analysis of French Revolution is not limited to French Revolution as a concrete historical event, but tells something significant about the general political situation of modernity itself, and that something significant that is uh, symptomatically omitted in uh, typical liberal view. Then in the third part, uh, I will at last turn to the phenomenon of fascism and show how, with the preceding Hegelian clarification um, of the structure of political field of modernity, uh, we can more sharply see the inadequacy of understanding fascism through the prism of totalitarian paradigm. Uh, and uh, uh, I will show the essential conceptual difference of fascism from any, uh, any kind of socialist politics. So let's start with uh, liberalism and totalitarian paradigm. Here I will not be concerned about any particular liberalism, uh, particular liberalist author, author. I will try to speak about uh, liberalism as a certain common sense of contemporary political situation, a way of thinking we have come to be pretty accustomed to. Um, so what I, will, I, will not be, um, I will not try to attack um, liberalism as a, some coherent political doctrine, uh, precisely because I think that it's um, essentially isn't a coherent political doctrine. It is, on the contrary, a certain unstable political position uh, characterized by a certain te tension that causes it to constantly misrepresent uh, the political situation of modernity and can, uh, for this reason, quite surprisingly smoothly slide into its opposite. Um, so, um, um, the essential part of this common sense liberalism uh, seems to be, as I mentioned, the totalitarian paradigm. That is the idea that uh, totalitarianism is a good concept to grasp uh, certain elements of 20th century politics. Liberalism needs totalitarianism as its great enemy, as its opposite, as an example of a wrong and dysfunctional way, a catastrophic way to approach, approach uh, political modernity. Totalitarianism is a danger that lurks in the background as soon as we stray from the same doctrine of individual freedom, which means by 
uh, hidden lubrication, safe, co safe combination of market economy and civilized that is not too seriously taken parliamentary democracy. Um, but uh, what is this uh, totalitarianism? Uh, we could confront it at a theoretical level, but um, it turns out it's, it is a bit hard to grasp. It's hard to pinpoint. It is, after all, sort of a liberal swear word, similarly how fascism is a certain leftist swear word. Um, but as I said, this, uh, this uh, liberal consensus and totalitarian paradigm, they do function already, I think, on a certain pre-theoretical level. Um, I would say much of it operates already on the level of images that pervade the popular car, uh, culture. Um, you know, one, one can think of typical example is the famous uh, Apple commercial of 1984 with uh, some dynamic young athlete uh, storming into the room, throwing hammer into the uh, certain uh, Big Brother screen that captivates the look um, of a mass of uniform from great, great people. Um, so this is uh, this was what I'm talking about: this uh, totalitarian paradigm that uh, is persistent because it provides a, a powerful imagery that very neatly structures the political field into sort of it makes, an, it makes a, a position between two series. And on one side, you have order, uniformity, repression, collectivity, conformism, tyranny of majority, state power, and on the other hand, uh, pluralism, freedom, creativity, change, private initiative. Individualism. So, and in the series, the the central position seems to be individual versus state, or individual versus any kind of organized collectivity. So, so what I'm gonna do in my um, what will follow? Well, I'll argue that such organization of political positions is uh, not, slip, not simply wrong, but wrong in a, some clever and effective way. That is, uh, such organization of political field provides some, some essential distortion um, that is uh, especially connected with uh, liberal understanding or misunderstanding of fascism. Now, second, second part, Hegel. So using Hegel to criticize this liberal political disposition is not an arbitrary move. Um, it is significant that within liberal perspective, Hegel is often rejected precisely as a part of this dangerous totalitarian tendency, or at least as its precursor, more strenuously so in, of course, in Karl Popper's Open Society and its enemies. And it's also symptomatic that it doesn't even seem to be particularly important whether, we, whether Hegel is rejected as too right or too left, because for this liberal common sense is both pretty much the same thing. Um, our intent is now, it's not simply to vindicate, uh, to defend Hegel against such accusations, so, to, although this could be possible, uh, but the point is rather that this uh, liberal rejection of Hegel is not a coincidence, because his political thought, uh, which, is, uh, well, which, is not, which is not in any sense anti-liberal, but it does effectively undermine the consensual basis of totalitarian paradigm. Namely, what is of interest here to me is uh, that Hegel has already formulated a certain critique of, let's say, of a too enthusiastic mass democratic politics, namely uh, when he analyzed the uh, French Revolution. So, now, quick outline of uh, Hegelian critique of French Revolution as formulated in Phenomenolo Phenomenology of Spirit. Uh, this analysis is part of section of Spirit, um, which is a section of the book that traces in a few very large steps uh, the actual history of the spirit, or with a bit more profane expression, the history of Western civilization. Within Hegel's account, the condition for the spirit to become revolutionary is the preceding mo movement of enlightenment and its thorough critique of religion and for any transcendence in general. At the competition, at the final success of this enlightenment, enlightenment critique, spirit finally finds itself in total imminence of this world. Now it has no external object, nothing that it would encounter, nothing that, it, that would limit it. It knows itself as purely self-determining, that is, it knows itself as free. It is pure su uh, subjectivity of a general will, or with a bit more contemporary uh, vocabulary, it becomes, it becomes a unified political subject, the we of modern politics. Um, because there is nothing alien to it, to which it could relate, it can only relate to itself as an empty demand for absolute freedom. And here precisely for Hegel the problems appear, because as long as spirit 
in the form of some general sovereign political will, upholds this demand for immediate absolute freedom, it cannot give, give itself any concrete form, any determined organization, because to organize a people means that individual wills must, at least to a certain extent, abandon this position of immediate universality and turn to their own private particular task within this totality. Then the only thing that can happen in this situation of absolute freedom for Hegel is that this unified universal will turns against itself in a chaos of self-negation. Whatever happens, what, uh, whatever law or action does the clique or part, party in power uh, make, it is never truly, no, no action is truly universal enough. Um, it, is, it, it is always submitted to a suspicion of being a sort of expression of private particular interest, um, and it's also constantly guilty of n not being universal. So how does this situation end? This chaos of revolution eventually exhausts itself. After mad, mad circle of negation, it at last, uh, it, it last negates, negates itself. Having cleaved through this chaos, um, the individual eventually abandons his claim to grasp the universality immediately and find satisfaction in the limited sphere of private life. Okay, uh, we won't venture further into Hegelian thought or in the, any evaluation of meaning of correctness or final consequences of uh, Hegel's critique of revolution. Here we will just say that this critique, uh, this is a restructure his major political philosophy, philosophy of the state. Most importantly, it results in his concept of civil society, that is a sphere uh, which, says, which the state allows within itself, well, where it is allowed to the individual to pursue his own interest by himself, a distance from state, from universality, in other words, to mind his own business. Um, so, as you can see, uh, the final, the Hegel's argument is in final consequence quite liberal, but in a sort of sophisticated way. Um, as I said, that's not the place to discuss that. Uh, instead, what I will do, I will draw from this Hegelian critique some decisive, decisive, decisive conceptual distinction that helps us to more accurately grasp what is at stake in modern politics. I would claim this. I would claim that Hegel's, Hegel's critique of French Revolution is a version of a liberal critique of universalist state violence, except it's done correctly, done right. Not in the sense that it decisively and conclusively condemns any further progress, progressivist uh, egalitarian agenda, but in the sense that it does address, it does depict some a actual tension in politics, in progressive politics. Um, but there is absolutely essential difference what Hegel's critique differs from a typical liberal criticism of statism, of egalitarianism, or of democracy. Hegel indeed depicts some um, violence of universality at work. However, it is precisely not the violence that subsumes the individual under some total universal order. On the contrary, the problem of this violence is that it cannot constitute any stable order or organization. Hegel shows that universalist violence of the state that arises from unified popular sovereignty cannot function, cannot happen without including a certain point of political empowerment from inclusion of individual within the sovereignty. This violence arises precisely because every individual is raised to, to be immediately universal individual. In fact, it is demanded that he is such. So a certain universal principle cannot really saturate the society without at the same time making the the people into equal political subjects with equal claim to power. And this is, I think, the difference from the structure that is generally imagined or offered by totalitarian paradigm, this uh, phantasmatic image of totalitarianism. Within totalitarian, totalitarian paradigm, we could say that uh, some unified universal principle is supposed to somehow pervade and structure the whole of society without, at the same time, making the members of the society, the, indiv the individuals, um, without giving them political power, without raising them to the level of universality. The lesson we can draw from Hegel is, is that it is not clear how such thing could even ever happen. Uh, how it could happen that people were ruled from some certain distant central point without at the same time having some sort of a claim uh, to, this, to this point of universality. So, Hegel's point is that such universalist principle could not be at the same time effective and truly oppressive, although it can be, to a certain extent, destructive. Um, so, as we have seen in the example of French Revolution, 
both moments have to be present at the same time. It is at the same time a dictatorship and anarchy. It's a dictatorship, it's a di dictatorship because everyone is a universal subject. Um, there is no part of individual which would remain private. But for the same reason, he has equal pretension to power. Um, everything is political, everything concerns everyone, so there has to be a certain moment of political chaos include, included. On the other hand, the totalitarian paradigm imagines a system where everything is political, yet there is no politics. And I think this is a certain point of incoherence. Now we can finally move to the question of fascism, which is the third part. At this point I can lay my cards on the table and state my basic point I wish to make, I think which would be obvious enough. Uh, the essential new divided line that I wish to draw is this, that of course there is some sort of an etatist, uh, statist, universalist violence present from the French Revolution all, uh, onwards and it is also characteristic of any of any further later socialist revolution and uh, even socialist politics in general. But however, fascism is nothing like that. It's precisely the opposite. It's, it's the use of state power in directly the opposite way. It is the use of state power precisely not to, um, not to raise, uh, not, not to introduce a certain universality, but to enforce the liberal order of private freedoms, of private property, where this order has ceased to be able to function by normal means. Um, so, let's expand on that. First, one thing we have to adjust if we are to apply previous Hegelian considerations to the context of properly modern, that is, industrial capitalist society, which is the con uh, context where the question of totalitarianism takes place. Considering time of Hegel's writing, of course, his concepts are surprisingly pertinent. However, his grasp of industrial capitalist society was still a bit lacking. Uh, we said that he envisaged, envisaged the outcome of French Revolution and functioning of modern state as a certain reconciliation of individual with his own particularity, particularity in private life. Uh, however, the central problem that arises later on in a fully developed capitalist society is that perhaps such reconciliation with particularity, that is, finding satisfaction in the private sphere of family of work, is not possible for everyone. Um, Hegel, it seems, was mostly looking at, um, at early capitalism, economy of farming, manufacture, small business, um, where when having one's own place of business seemed generally possible. However, capitalist society properly, proper, uh, with its mass industrial scale production and mass, masses of workers, uh, which, uh, who much more obviously cannot relate to their place of work in any particularly attached manner. Uh, workers uh, who exist more and more as a disposable workforce, perhaps as unemployed reserve army of labor, uh, and who are in any case alienated from their work, that is, the, uh, and cannot find themselves in any particular segment, segment and so their social participation is uh, reduced to being holders of abstract universal labor power. So uh, it can appear in post hegelian co uh, context that uh, that universal subject. In, uh, indeterminate subject, subject without any particularity, is not merely a political category imposed by the modern state, but an economic category, uh, some necessarily imminent outcome of a um, completely apolitical economic life. Um, and of course, um, this is the point that has been seized uh, later on by the Hegelian Marxists, most notably early Lukács. Um, in essence, Lukács interpreted revolutionary potential of proletariat precisely as this <coughs> universal, emptied subject uh, that can then, in final revolutionary move, reappropriates uh, this foreign objectivity. However, um, uh, um, the, point, the point I'd like to make is that this uh, modern industrial society uh, always includes some imminent threat to orderly liberal part, bourgeois politics. Um, uh, this change of uh, situation um, um, 
with the new phenomenon of mass, mass politics doesn't simply mean that there is a massive amount of people involved in politics, but that these people participate as a mass of indeterminate abstract individuals. And uh, it was this mass that typically scared and repulsed any, most of the liberal thinkers. It was something that liberalism has had trouble digesting, um, because it was this mass uh, signified, <coughs> um, well, this mass signified tensions that can be well integrated in the society imagined by the classical political thought. Mm. So, fear, uh, this fear of mass politics is a political perception of underlying economic instability that can produce moments of crisis that destroy the conditions of liberal order. And fascism is, I claim, exactly the political position that intervenes in times of this crisis, that intervenes in times where the conditions of normal functioning of bourgeois society are not met. Here, the best possible reference is uh, Son Rettel's account of fascism, or uh, here we should be more precise, of Nazism specifically. Uh, Son Rettel's account in a nutshell is this. German Nazism was a solution to an endogenous crisis of capitalism, a solution to crisis of capitalism that changed as little as possible in order for things to start functioning again. Um, namely, to be more concrete, uh, in Germany there was a battle between two camps of German industry. One was highly technologically developed, reliant on exports, able to compete on the international market. Um, and, uh, and the other sector was comprised of heavy industry, which in the 20s greatly overexpanded. Um, and with the crisis of the 30s, uh, it, was, uh, it was impossible to, eat, um, to adjust to a lower demand because due to expensive and complex machinery evolved, involved, the fixed uh, costs of the production were huge and machines actually had to keep to on producing, had to um, keep on overproducing um, um, uh, because that was the only economic feasible solution. Uh, so this second industrial camp desperately needed uh, some alternative means to keep itself sustainable. It needed, a, so to say, a continuation of economics with, by other means. And here is where the Nazism stepped in. What Hitler did effectively was to replace the normal market conditions with a huge state consumption, consumption primarily with war industry, which restored profitability and hence the purpose of this bankrupt sector of the capital. So what happened was that large parts of German capital lost their ground under defeat, capital suddenly turned to the useless, machine, useless machines, and then Nazi militarism, which integrated capital in an alternative regime of the term of the Germanic Socialists was a very wel welcome solution to this camp. So it, it's interesting to note how, how limited, how insubstantial was then the political function that uh, Hitler, Hitler and Nazi, Nazis performed regarding this um, uh, industrial capital once they came to power. Far from requiring to do any serious intervention into functioning of economy or for some reorganization of the economy, he just needed to step into this potentially chaotic, um, uh, uh, empty, empty space that was open typed by the crisis and in a certain, in a certain, uh, we could say, uh, to hold it together, to, to, to feel it. I have an interesting quote from Sonorator where he describes a function uh, a function of fear from the uh, point of view of individual businessmen, of a holder of particular interest. Quote, um, whenever an interested party saw his horizon for um, then his thoughts lost themselves in the maze. At this borderline, he no longer thought rightly or wrongly, he no longer thought at all. There began his nightmare, and it was from this nightmare that Hitler must rescue him. The Führer will put it all to right. The blind faith in Führer stemmed from the transcendence of social synthesis of private interests and from the consciousness that this synthesis is happening in the benefit of private interests as much as possible. This is why Führer was imbued with in the vacuum of transcendence with astonishing power. So here apparently uh, Hitler, Führer, or actually the word itself, uh, serves sol solely as a point of universality in the sense that it gives the individual producer reassurance that his private business fits somewhere. Uh, it fits somewhere in the social totality, reassurance that they, are, that they do have some universal function. So, totally contrary to 
any universalist political principle which requires political, uh, active political en engagement. Uh, the name of the, the name Hitler functions precisely as a guarantee that things function even if one remains at a distance from universality. Uh, actually, one can see how here Hitler takes precisely, no, the name Hitler takes precisely the function that is in the normal situation performed by money. He's an obscure, intransparent object that assures that priva privately performed economic activity does not remain hanging in the air. So in this regard, Nazism was definitely a continuation of existing power relations with alternative means. Um, However, what still remains a, a possible source of confusion and possibly the main reason why one would still want to ascribe to a fascism a certain quasi-leftist anti-capitalist char character was the apparently, um, apparently obvious fact that it was a mass phenomenon. So how should we understand um, the function of mass in fascism? Um, because if we, again, if we look to the spontaneous imagery connected to fascism, it seems that um, this was essential. Uh, it was a mass phenomenon which out of nowhere introduced unity and discipline in a disorganized Weimar Republic. Um, well, here I will recruit an unlikely supporter, Hannah Arendt. The positions she built in the origins of totalitarianism uh, is an example of, let's say, reflected, sophisticated liberalism. Um, in, in, in some sense, her argument is built quite along the uh, Hegelian conceptual lines. That is, um, uh, among the crucial elements of, of totalitarianism, she of course includes precisely this, its mass character, its reliance on this unstructured masses of atomized individuals, um, as opposed to the liberal societies of structure, of social differentiation, of organization of society by states, by classes, and by interest groups. But so that she can make this point and then equate within the, this notion of totalitarianism both Stalinism and fascism, she has to, at some point, casually say that there were, after all, difference with differences between, uh, um, between Stalinism and uh, fascism, actually, Nazism. Um, uh, namely, the difference that uh, resulted from the, the different starting position. She says that while the, um, um, while the, the, while the Nazism already had its masses ready-made, um, because they resulted from the crisis of capitalism, um, the Stalinism, on the other hand, had to precisely first to produce these masses. But I would say, isn't it precisely the crucial difference? We can agree when Arendt says uh, that Stalinism was bent on destroying any partial social organization or classes or states, eventually even cannibalizing the bureaucratic and military system. Um, however, this is, this is all that we know as a state is violence. For example, the collectivization and the, the purges. Um, it, it's um, the book, it definitely is um, sort of a typically modernist violence of negativity of this of dissolution, um, because um, I would say because Stalin decided that he has to accomplish much of what has been earlier accomplished in the more developed states by the processes of primitive accumulation. But on the other hand, if Germany uh, if in Germany the, this dissolution of previous order had already took place, if it was a precondition for Nazism, it was not the function of Nazism precisely the opposite. German Naz Nazism had got its masses ready-made, but then this means that Nazism's function was solely to organize these masses, to structure them, which is to say to get rid of them as the masses. So how can it be this reconciled with the standard image of mass character of fascism? Uh, of this powerful imagery of huge crowds, uniform men, mass rise of people. Well, undeniably, the, the Nazism was a mass movement with a strong mobilizing poten potential, and this mass character was crucial of its essence as to power. But as Son Rettel warns us, we should not equate the power base of, of Nazism that brought it to power with the one that kept it in power. Um, the uh, Nazi movement started, definitely started as some sort of quasi-revolutionary movement, recruiting its members from the mass of unemployed young people, but mostly it was lower middle classes, not proletariat. Um, so younger unemployed people who had, that, which, who had their expectations of normal life dashed by the crisis. Um, Hannah Arendt displays symptomatic displacement when she connects 
uh, their entry to the, in, into the party um, with their desire to lose themselves in the movement. I think it's uh, it's much more appropriate to say that they uh, they went they joined the Nazi movement precisely to find themselves um, to find the purpose uh, to, to to differentiate themselves from the from the, this structuralist mess um, because yeah Nazi movement gave gave them purpose. Um, having dreams and some pathetic, pathetic heroic story of war and of victory. Mm -hmm. mm. However, what is not nearly and often enough emphasized regarding Nazism is, is this, that this movement didn't simply take over Germany. What it undeniably did was to provide enough support to bring Hitler to chancellorship, but at the same, at the same time the movement <laughs> Which is violence and its vague revolutionary ambitions scandalized and scared and scared at the functioning part of German society. Most importantly, the army, which could definitely remove Hitler from power at any point, was quite worried about SA and their open ambitions to replace the army as a military structure. So, in order for Hitler to keep himself in power, he had precisely to get rid of these uh, unwelcome supporters in uh, in knife of long knives. Far from being a further escalation of disruptive Nazi violence, Night of Long Knives, was uh, a gift, a concession to the old regime. Um, so to conclude, um, um, this mass character of Nazism is, I believe, overrated. It is a distortion that stems from the over-reliance on images, on a, spect on a spectacle that Nazism aptly provided. Focus on this aspect of Nazism turns the whole phenomenon in a bizarre and alien object of a certain repulsed fascination. On the contrary, I will here uh, agree with the point uh, Isha Elanda repeatedly makes, uh, his instruction that regarding fascism we need something like inverse of a Fremdung's effect. That is, we should stop being fascinated by its bizarre and foreign imagery and instead consider how it was a product of a certain concrete political situation, that it was a certain moment, moment precisely the most normal, normal way of system to keep functioning. Um, so we can see from the history of rise of Nazism to power that, it, that this essence wasn't one of some mysterious mass captivation of a whole nation in one unified movement, but on the contrary, it was a product of hetero heterogeneous political alliances partly in contradiction to one another. But, um, various factions followed the same party at various times for completely different reasons. So perhaps we shouldn't even search for some new ultimate secret, ultimate principle of fascism, perhaps it's ultimate secret and it's great danger at the same time is that there is no such thing that the fascism as some unified uh, principle that functions, uh, that uh, captivates the whole society, doesn't even exist. That's it. Thank you, Martin. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, okay, uh, I will now open the floor uh, for questions and uh, comments. Uh, we actually don't have much time for questions, but don't worry because uh, you can pose uh, additional questions to the panelists at the general discussion, which will take place at uh, 5 uh, p.m. But uh, for now we have 15 minutes uh, so for questions. And uh, if you have a question or a comment, just raise your hand and you will be given the microphone. Okay, uh, if there are no questions, then uh, I will start. Uh, Anjan, you basically uh, finished uh, your lecture by claiming that uh, you don't think that liberalism is uh, completely useful, and I suppose uh, you were talking useless. Uh, uh, I suppose you were talking from the standpoint standpoint of uh, emancipatory progressive uh, politics. And my question would be, what is uh, useful uh, in liberalism? I mean, I, I guess we can all agree that the fact that we can participate in politics by elections, uh, the fact that we don't have to work for 14 hours and so on, or else. <clears throat> progressive moves that liberalism have brought now. I guess it's a question which part of liberalism did that and how should we call these um, fractions and socialism. Or that. I, I suppose this could be the main, the main benefits. <laughs> okay, thank you. Do you have anything to add? No? Uh, 
Uh, so, okay. any questions, comments now? Also for, uh, for Russia, I, I'm not sure if I heard correct at the end of the lecture that you said that somehow the role or the function of uh, fascism is to sustain also as an indifference towards Okay. It's better? I didn't mean that the market is abolished completely, I just meant the, let's say, internal market, obviously. There's a world market in which a fascist state or a Nazi state was operating, but what I meant was um, all these uh, labor, Nazi labor laws, all these uh, restrictions of labor movement and so on, so basically this was what, I, maybe I should just uh, point this out more exactly when I was talking, but I didn't mean the complete abolition of the market. I, I hope that. Um, no, I don't think I, I would support this formula that keep the uh, uh, capitalist relations uh, independently of the market. I mean, um, I mean, of course, it's uh, there was never an opportunity to uh, for such system to function in a particular extended period of time, but. Uh, Yes, of course we can, you can add a certain other, another principle of, 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 uh, of keeping the production functioning uh, so that is state power, state consumption makes it independent of the market. Yes. So the, the war economy of it's precisely that, keep the, the capitalist relations of productions independently of the market. Uh, okay, uh, do we hear? So I have a question regarding actually this that you said about the market. I mean, uh, you mentioned the industrial cartons. I mean, you know, uh, Thyssen and Schlacht and on the other hand you have like uh, uh, IG Farben AG and Siemens in Germany. And they were actually debating with Hitler about, you know, in the, the course which the Nazi party should take in order actually uh, how to conquer foreign markets. So it was an actual debate. And I think that uh, we need to be clear on this. I mean. Uh, if there was an abolition of markets, as you say, inside Germany, that where there was not an abolition of markets outside Germany. So and this meant that actually German industry, uh, chemical plants and other things, needed to expand, you know, into the Western Balkans, into the other parts of Europe, in order to sustain their uh, aggregate demand. So I think this is a question that we need to reconsider on this. And the other thing that I would actually um, just wanted to ask, I mean, you mentioned so already, and uh, I just wanted, wanted to ask, I mean, these cartels and industrial relations, are they all that we need to consider when we speak about fascism? Because, uh, for example, John Zorrettel has this uh, thesis that uh, this was not all there is, Zorrettel. Huh? Yeah, so he has this thesis that actually uh, fascism, the fascist party, uh, actually shifted the locus of class struggle, not between the bourgeois and the proletarianized masses, but between the upper classes themselves, and hence leading to the cartel debate uh, that you mentioned earlier. And basically, uh, what this means is that, uh, you know, the, the, the field of view of class struggle looks a, a, fairly, a little bit different. And uh, I would actually add to this Reinhard Kuhn's thesis. He says that uh, we should keep in mind that the Nazi party was not, you know, uh, a servant of capital, of monopoly capital, but it has, in fact, uh, had a certain amount of uh, autonomy, you know, with regards to the monopoly capital itself. And these two camps that you mentioned are actually a manifestation of that. So I just wanted, uh, you know, your comments on that. Uh, for the first point, I definitely agree, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, no, I, I didn't mean to apply the abolition of markets, but a certain uh, circumvention of markets in the certain historical periods, and yes, I agree the the need for expansion of the of the, of the industry into 
in the foreign markets was, uh, was very pertinent um, and uh, did determine the course. Uh, the second point, uh, whether it's enough, okay, no, well, probably not. I mean, uh, it's uh, still, uh, uh, I, I only mentioned two partial bases of support, that is early support of the lower middle class and then industrial capital, well, of course. Okay. My point is that it's a precisely a quite complex web of relations which don't even have a sort of unified principle that we have to imagine fascism as not as this something that descends on the society, but um, sort of every, something that everyone agrees with because it's uh, uh, the most, yeah, the most, in the, that everyone agrees with in sort of an opportunistic way and uh, yeah, from, the, um, from his own particular position. Uh, so I, I guess, yeah, there could, there could be many more detailed, detailed analysis of, of the various factions that supported uh, fascism. And power and uh, sorry, the last point was yeah. and, uh, okay. So, do we have any additional questions or comments? Uh, if not, okay, we have a question maybe for both of you. Uh, uh, Andrzej, you have emphasized uh, this uh, following Ishelanda, the, the liberal split, the split between economic and uh, political uh, liberalism and it seemed that uh, within this schema uh, political uh, liberalism is uh, nevertheless at least potentially uh, seen as something progressive. It is the case that uh, economic liberalism basically prevents uh, political liberalism from being liberal uh, uh, in a sense. So would you agree with that uh, formulation and uh, I mean, uh, and, but you, Martin, uh, you actually emphasize that uh, liberalism is not uh, concerned really with uh, the defense of abstract individuality and universality, but rather uh, defends the rights of a concrete uh, individual embedded in some pre-political uh, texture, some pre-political fabric. In this sense, liberalism is a uh, defense of privilege uh, and cannot have a really, uh, progressive potential even in its political variant. Uh, is that the case or would you put it differently? Yes, I mean, it, okay, I did use it in this way, that the notion of liberalism, but well, yes, we have to keep in mind that liberalism is sort of a a bit floating signifier, so it can move. I mean, I was trying to get as general a concept of liberalism as possible. I didn't try to, to limit myself to purely to economic liberalism. Um, I would say that even political liberalism has a bit of a trouble with this in any universal it's principle, except maybe the most basic one that, you know, that we are all abstract individuals. Uh, in a sense, but even that, I mean, I would say, yes, the, the political, even the, well, the, 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 by liberalism I mean more, more certain, yeah, political disposition that is quite, um, quite, uh, quite uh, worried about any case of universal poet, universalist politics and uh, even, even what we would call liberalism in politics was usually not achieved by liberal political positions, but liberal means, so to say, you need a sort of more ambitious universalist project. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would agree with you but about political liberalism being progressive, um, but I think um, it cannot be progressive by itself, because exactly, it's not universal, it's particular, and that's what I was kind of trying to say, but I also like to add that these divisions, political liberalism, economic liberalism, so on, is a uh, abstract divisions, we might as well talk about, I don't know, radical enlightenment, moderate enlightenment, and so on. I guess it's more important what, uh, what we say about it in the very content. And as Martin said, it's sort of a floating signifier. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I have a question for Martin. I didn't uh, quite get your concluding point. If I understood you correctly, you propose that we take fascism as a kind of a contingent uh, class compromise or something like that. I mean, in intra-class compromise, uh, of, uh, I mean, as a coalition project of, of, of sort. 
uh, where I mean, uh, if I can also I mean um, take uh, Alfred Zondrito as my reference. Uh, he, uh, of course, on the level of, of analysis, shows that you know uh, this was not a uniform capital project. I mean, Nazis, Nazism in uh, Germany. But he also, on the other hand, uh, te tells that uh, fascism, uh, in his uh, eyes, is uh, basically. I think his formulation is uh, ideological anti-capitalism, or perhaps fuzzy anti-capitalism, as opposed to true anti-capitalism of the communist kind. So basically, he um, he presents it as a kind of, a kind of a reactionary project, you know. So in, in this sense, despite that he also tries to show on, on, a, on the an analytical plane that the, uh, the fascism, pro, uh, the project of fascism, is, I mean, truly some kind of a coalition project, you know, as a coalition of different, uh, also opposing interests. But on the level of, uh, but still there is something that you know. Um, uh, that it goes beyond these particular uh, interests, and this is, you know, uh, this uh, reactionary function of fascism as a project that also tries to, you know, um, defend capital as such in uh, general. So basically, that would be my uh, qu my uh, question: Do you, I mean, do you um, allow for fascism fascism to be anything more than what you said it is? No, well. I would say, um, uh, I wouldn't even say that I would characterize it as a compromise in the sense that you know, we'll give something to them and something to, to the workers. It definitely wasn't that. I mean, it was a contingent, uh, it was composed of heterogeneous political forces, but not in the sense of compromise. It wasn't so transparent. I mean, I think that this anti capitalist part was completely irrelevant for any actual politics. So it was much more of a restoration of. Of capitalism, um, yeah, that's it. I mean, it's, it was a at the moment when capitalism couldn't really reproduce itself with normal means. It needed some additional political uh, political force that, that enabled it to function uh, onwards. And so, to a very small extent, it did interrupt the normal functioning of the market, but only in order to so it could uh, proceed with the accumulation. Uh, we have time for one more question, but then, as I already said, uh, we can continue the debate at 5 p.m. Then maybe I can pose a concluding question. So we've only uh, talked about the relation between fascism and uh, mostly 19th century or the early 20th century liberalism, but what about uh, the liberalism of uh, the late 20th century and the beginning of 21st century, that is neoliberalism. So, uh, what, how would you conceptualize the relation between these two political projects? Uh, so, if some of you. Uh, well, I'm not sure if this is well, it's quite a topic because then we have, we have a good, uh, another, another problematic, uh, problematic unity of what is exactly is neoliberalism. But, uh, well, I'll just add that, hmm. well, in some sense, it's, it's not very compatible, at least in this, uh, uh, at least, hmm. well, at least in the aspects that it's a bit, uh, raising importance of the international relation of capital that I think would prevent and that this runs contrary to the historical development that's brought about Nazism. Is that you have a very quite effective uh, international international uh, capital organizations so uh, that that prevents any sort of uh, political aid to the to the, to the uh, national capital you know, uh, at the expense of the foreign capital. <coughs>